Second John verse one. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Verse 4. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to His commands. As you have heard from the beginning, His command is that you walk in love. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Verse 9. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greetings. That's the letter of 2 John. The author, John the Apostle, called the Elder. And uh, it's a personal letter. It's uh, quite different, you know, from other some other writings because you have the real, real personal touch and address to the lady here, too. It's really different from other writings, even in the New Testament, because it's unique in that it's addressed to a lady. There's some questions. Some have said, well, maybe the lady's representative of the church or something. Well, obviously, we can take the letter and apply it to the church, but it is what it says. So it, it's, it's directed toward the lady and those that obviously she's led to the Lord or even part of her family. And that's how I choose to look at that. Even in 3 John, over to the next letter, uh, you see a similar uh, introduction or greeting. The elder is there to my dear friend uh, Gaius. And so it's very personal, speaking directly to Gaius here. Whom I love in the truth. So I think in the case of both letters, we can accept it simply as it says that this is a personal letter to this lady and her children. Uh, written to the chosen lady. And notice also, um, we're, we can draw several principles from the letter, I think, for us today. And I'm hoping it's helpful to you, minister to your heart. Let's look at the truth that lives. Down in... Um, Let's see. He said to the chosen lady of children, whom I love in the truth. Basically saying, I love you. Uh, he, he's opened uh, the uh, next letter as well, basically saying, I love you. And so they're very personal here. But it, it's the love that comes from Christ. It's love in the truth. And it's truth that is alive. God's Word is alive. And God's Word transforms us. It changes us. It changes how we feel about people. When we come to Christ, it alters our thinking and our emotion as to how we feel about people. And so he says, he says to her, I love uh, in the truth. Not only I, but also all who know the truth love her in the truth too. So there's that kind of Love and strong love there. Others love in the truth. So it's not only a singular from John in that sense, but it's also others that have this love. So it's a love we share.
through Christ and because of the truth of God, and specifically the truth about Jesus Christ. And that's what he centers on here in the passage. We know the broader idea. The broader idea of the truth as it's revealed to us in the Bible. And, uh, and of course, the specific idea as we look in the letters, in the epistles here, Jesus as the Son of God. He, God has become man and we can love because of that. And John said that in his gospel too. He kept over and over again. One reason we believe this is definitely the Apostle John because he, he hits on the same uh, feeling, the same idea, the same uh, teaching as he had in the epistle as well as the gospel. And so others love. We share this love in the truth for one another. And I guess especially we have love for those that are serving God. Especially. There's a, you know, and it's the love that's alive. It's truth that lives in us. Not passive, but it's <laughs> real. It's alive. It's with us forever. He said in... Um, let me find it here. <coughs> Verse 2, because of the truth, truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. There's so much, so much here instruction could come from this. This is truth that is alive in us, as I've said over and over again. And uh, when when we come to Christ, we're coming to the living one. It's not just an intellectual decision that he was God or an intellectual decision that he came into the world. We're coming to the living one who deals with us now. His spirit comes to live in us. And his spirit in us is alive. And as John had said in the gospel, it's the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. In John 14, I think. He said it was the spirit of truth. He's with us forever. Jesus said, I'm with you till the end of the age. But it's even more than the end of the time here. It's much, it goes beyond the end of time here. He's with us. This is truth that lives forever. It's a Christ that lives forever. And then he says in the introduction, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. Will be with us. So there's the in us and there's the with us. Here, His grace and mercy and treat, uh, peace. We get the whole package when we come to Christ. His grace, mercy, and peace is with us. It's all there. It's eternally, forever, and with us now, and with us in the future. He promised, how much more can we get? How much more secure could we be? The source of joy. Look at what he says in verse 4. Uh, it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. So maybe some of them weren't. But his joy was found in the ones that were walking in truth. Doesn't that excite you? Don't you get joyful when you think about someone following Jesus Christ? Doesn't that make you uh, fill you with a sense of satisfaction and peace and God's mercy has been put upon that person? Doesn't that bring joy to your life? You see, He changes our emotions when we come to Christ. Our love is different. Our joy is different. The things that used to make us joyful no longer, but now this is what makes us joyful, that others might come to know Christ. He said, I, I, it's given me great joy. Great joy. Not just, not just a little joy, but great joy because some of your children are walking in the truth. Look for what God is doing around your life will be much more happy. <laughs> Examine closely what God is doing. Look with faith. Don't just think about the terrible things happening in the world all the time. Think about what is God doing? What is God doing? actively working in the lives of people? This is the source of this joy is that truth. It's really different. Then he says, I ask. He gave a request down in verse 5. Dear lady, I'm not writing to you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. Because he keeps going over and over, you know, through the epistles and even in the gospel. He just keeps going over and over again. It's not a new command. <laughs> I ask that we love one another. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, verse 6, that we walk in obedience to his commands 
as you have heard from the beginning, His command is that you walk in love. Well, we can't walk in that love without Christ in our life and under the control of our life. We just can't do it. We, we have to have the Spirit of Christ ruling our hearts and minds. Is that true for you today? Is the Spirit of Christ ruling over your life today? I hope so. The, John says, I ask you that we love one another. It's a humble request. You know, our desires change when we come to Christ. They're not, not only in, in the sense of our love and, or in the sense of, of what we view as truth or our joy emotionally, but now our desires. John's saying, I ask you. I'm asking you this. So his desire, his request before them. What is your request before God? What is it you really want to see happen among the people of God? What is it? Have you thought about that? What is it you really desire to see? I ask you, he said in verse 5. The truth that is practiced. Verse 7. There's many deceivers over and over again. You know, this comes up. Many deceivers. Jesus said it was one of the signs of the end times. There's false Christ. Many, many false Christ. John says many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. Well, they may say that they believe. They may even go as far to say they believe in Jesus. But their idea and their definition of what it means is really different. And that's true today among the false teachers. Because there's many deceivers. You know, a person can say anything. You can, you can say, I believe in God. All you want to say. That doesn't mean it's necessarily true. Or it doesn't mean necessarily that that your idea of what it means to believe in God is true. So, so many people, they may even claim to believe in God or a God or some form of God. That doesn't mean they're Christian. It definitely doesn't mean we should have close fellowship with them either. And I think, John, one of the emphasis in the Gospel here is to be careful about that close fellowship. You are, you'll be able to recognize the sinners. Now, when truth is practiced, we, of course we have to believe it. It's believed, but when it's practiced in our life, then we begin to recognize deception that's out there. And he says that do not acknowledge, those who do not, deceivers that do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, they've gone out into the world and there's many of them. Any such person is a deceiver. And then John uses it again, the Antichrist. He, he had used it in this other epistle. I think chapter 2, 1 John. And uh, the Antichrist. The, that, I think he's referring to the spirit of Antichrist. That whole attitude and feeling that's against Christ and who Christ really is. So he said, any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. You know, uh, we, we have to take very serious false teaching. We have to take it really seriously, especially as we see it increase in the world. All of church history has experienced these false teachers from the very beginning. But as they grow in, in momentum throughout history and they've stretched their wicked hands around the globe, some of these are international organizations now that are spreading lies about Jesus Christ. And according to John, they're deceivers and they're antichrists. That's very strong language, but that's, that's how he uses it. And I think it's important to, to use that strong language because, uh, you know, the whole idea of being tolerant. We, we're to we tolerantly love, one, love, love people, whether they're believers or not. But that does not mean we accept their beliefs. That doesn't mean we, we tolerate without speaking about their beliefs. Because we have to point out the truth and we have to point out error. And here he says uh, uh, clearly they're deceivers in Antichrist. Verse 8, Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Now he's talking to the believers there obviously. And he's given a clear warning because those that practice the truth, in other words, i.e., I, they're following Christ closely. Those that are following Christ, okay, practicing the truth, they are to keep their faith strong. Now, there's certain things, obviously, we have to do 
to keep our faith strong. And uh, we, we have to think seriously about You know, our daily fellowship with God. Personal, private, devotion, worship. Meeting with the believers. These are things that strengthen our faith. Satan wants to pull us away. Away from being alone with God. He wants to pull us away. Away from meditating in God's Word. He wants to pull you away from the fellowship. Of believers who wants to do that so that your faith would be weak and and in this context of, se of second John watch out that you do not lose what you've worked for this is not salvation by works at all it's talking about the believer here that has been serving Christ faithfully and can be deceived that's what he's talking about and so be careful and then he says there's a reason why. Because that you may be make sure that you don't lose it so that you can be rewarded fully. Because there's coming a glorious day for the believer in Christ that there will be a day of reward for those that have faithfully served the Lord. Even unto death. Faithfully serve Christ during difficult days. Faithfully serve Christ during days of deception and hardship, lies and hypocrisy. Faithfully serve Christ even though churches may be in an uproar and trouble going on. Faithfully serve Christ and walk with the Lord through all of those things. There will be a reward, a full reward. That's what he says. Now friend, there's nothing in the world wrong with you thinking, of thinking I can serve Christ for and be rewarded for it. That's how he functions. 